All right, let's do another example now. This is actually a uh, very real example. As, as always, I've kind of uh, prettified the numbers, um, but this comes from a hedge fund manager friend who in 2013 was looking at a fracking company in New York. Um, and the fracking company was called Drilling Unlimited, um, and their business was they were an energy development company, sometimes called ENP for exploration and production. They were publicly traded at the time, and they explored for, drilled for, and produced oil via fracking methods. Um, and they were exclusively limited to New York State and the shale deposits in Western New York State. So the question for my hedge fund manager friend was, um, should he buy uh, some DU stock or should he buy the whole firm? This is a fairly big outfit related to uh, JANA, which, yeah, as you may know, is a very large hedge fund. Um, so they could buy the whole firm. This isn't that big a firm. Um, so they're going to answer this by using the balance sheet valuation method, uh, just, like Warren, just like Warren Buffett would. So the first thing they want to look at to get ready to do this valuation is look at the gap financial statement, right? So this is gap from financial accounting, okay? And this is as filed by Drilling Unlimited with the SEC. So the units are in thousands. So you can see this is, this is a very small firm. Um, it's got a million in cash, four million in accounts receivable. They, as I'm sure you remember from accounting, different firms use different names for common accounting stuff. So some will say net receivable, some will say accounting, accounts receivable. So net receivable essentially means accounts receivable. Uh, other current assets, oil reserves, and this is going to be important. Uh, this is on measured on a gap basis, 300 million in oil reserves. That's oil that they believe uh, they own the rights to. It's under the ground and they just haven't pumped it out yet. Um, and their net property plant and equipment, right, which is their gross PPE minus all their accumulated depreciation is 5 million. And that again is at cost or cost minus where. So we add it all up. We get about 310 million for their assets. Their liabilities, they have a bunch of invoices to pay. They have some other current liabilities, probably accrued salary and stuff like that. Um, and they have a bunch of long-term debt, 240 million in long-term debt. So their gap equity is very small, right? So 5.5 million. But again, that doesn't really matter so much in terms of what's the value of the firm, okay? We're gonna to need to know more about the firm to do this balance sheet valuation method analysis. We're also gonna to have to know what Mr. Market thinks about the worth of this firm, okay? So we, as, as you know, I've prettified these numbers as, as I always do just to make things simpler for us. Um, so the share price at the time was around $10 a share and they had about 10 million shares outstanding. And a few other things that we need to note. And let's start noting this from the perspective of you working as an intern for this hedge fund manager. Um, so now let's say I'm your general manager and I'm telling you some things you should note. Um, so it's it's known throughout the oil industry that accrual accounting, accrual accounting is just a synonym for gap accounting, accrual accounting uh, methods for valuing oil reserves are, are really considered wildly inaccurate. They just don't have a lot to do with the true microeconomics of that oil. So the industry standard measure for determining how much uh, proved and how much oil reserves you have is by what's called proved and probable. And that's a, a clear protocol-based engineering methodology to determine the best possible estimate of the dollar value of the oil you have under the ground that you have the rights to, okay? So we're going to hire a geotechnical engineer who can give us proved and probable estimates. So we go ahead and do that. And she comes up with an estimate, a lower bound estimate 
of 500 million, okay, for proved and probable. So very different from the 300 million and change that's on the gap balance sheet. She also, she's an expert in the field, right? Um, so she also gets a market value estimate of the firm's PPE, and she says that's $10 million, which is about twice what it's being held on the balance sheet for, the gap balance sheet for. Okay, but wait, there's more, okay? Um, those of you who come from the Northeast, particularly New York, may remember that at this time, there was a big question as to whether New York in particular, and also Pennsylvania to some extent, were going to outlaw fracking. So the firm has also gone out and got a political consultant who estimated there's a 10% probability that Governor Cuomo, he was governor at the time, was going to outlaw fracking in the state, okay? And if that happens, if the governor does make that, um, and he can do that. This is not something that has to be put into a new law. He has the authority to do that. So if he decides to do that, in that case, our best estimate of the firm's value is that the assets equal the liabilities. So therefore, the equity value, the market value of the equity would be zero. Okay, so that would not be good, right? Okay, so let's see. I think we have everything we need now to do a complete balance sheet valuation method valuation of this firm. And I'm just going to follow the steps that I laid out in the beginning of this chapter. Okay, so let's find a nice lower bound for equity true value. So we start with the gap or the accrual accounting balance sheet. Okay, and we're going to replace the cost of those assets with conservative market values because we want to have a lower bound estimate. So the managing director now that would be me, tells you a little bit more. Um, the, I'll say, use the consultant's value for the value of the oil reserves and net PPE. We've used this consulting firm a lot before. This particular woman that they put on the job always does an excellent job for us. Also, I want us to be conservative. So in this case, let's assume that all the accounts receivables and other current assets are worth zero. Of course, that's unrealistic, but we want to be conservative. We want to do a lower bound estimate here. And that's a good way to make sure we really have a lower bound estimate. Okay, so we're going to think about step three. What's the awesome power of the Drilling Unlimited brand? Okay, and for this, we're going to ask the managing director. And that, again, would be me. And I'm going to say, assume no value. Right. Usually with any kind of business to business company, unless it's extremely huge, like Exxon or Kinder Morgan, something like that, which also both of those have a bunch of business to consumer stuff um, in general would be to be firms, business to business firms, which is drilling unlimited, unless they are huge, the market value of their brand is worth zero. And basically, they don't, it's a pretty simple firm. They don't have anything else that's missing from the gap balance sheet. So we'll assume zero. So we're assuming we have nothing extra to add to the balance sheet. We just have to morph the value of the assets shown to market values, okay? And once we do that, we will have our, um, be able to get our estimate of the intrinsic value here. And then we'll be able to compare that to what Mr. Market thinks and make a determination as to whether or not we should buy a bunch of shares or buy the whole firm or just walk away. Okay, so let's make a true value balance sheet. And let's do this before considering the fracking risk. We'll do the, we'll do the fracking risk later. Okay, so the net receivables, we said the managing director said zero. Other current assets, the managing director said zero okay and the managing director said for the oil reserves use the engineer's estimate right so that was 500,000 okay and the net ppe was 10 so, oh let me not put 20 in there uh 10,000 thousands uh commonly known as 10 million, okay? So let's see if we can add that up. We never change the cash because cash is what's shown in the checking account, all the cash accounts, and if that's wrong, it's fraud, and then we have another whole problem. So the cash is always correct. So 
we have uh, in these thousands units, we have a thousand cash, 500,000, 10,000, I think I can add that up. I think that's right, 511,000 thousands or 511 million. Okay, so we subtract the liabilities from that. I think I can do this, 511 minus 305, I think that's 206, 206, okay. So that in the units of thousands. So that's a heck of a lot more than the gap value of equity, right? Which was, we have 206 million, the gap equity was something like 5.5 .5 million. All right, so this would be our best estimate of what the firm is worth. Um, if Cuomo does not come in like the Bambi meets Godzilla movie squashes that fracking industry like a bug, right? And so that's so far, so far, so good here. And in this case, let me just back up for a second. A, a smart thing to do for this hedge fund, this Gianna related firm, um, if they do like it, if things look good at the bend, end of our analysis, they might literally want to come in, buy the firm, sell all the assets, maybe to bigger firms operating in the area, pay off the liabilities, and just enjoy the 206 million. Okay, so let's consider fracking risk now. And to do that, we, we want to use a weighted average, okay? And the way to think about that is we say 90% probability of okay, 10% um, probability of uh, equity equals zero, right? So um, we'll just apply like you learned in statistics, just standard weighted average formula. So that's going to be 90% times our 206. Oh, whoop, something happened there. Okay, times our uh, 206 million um, plus 10% probability of our 0. 0.0 equity value. And if we work that out, I think that's equal to something like 185, 500. And so we can say 185 million, just because these estimates are, are always, um, it's always a lot of uncertainty in them. So there's no point in having too many significant figures. And again, this is this is a good lower bound estimate because of our conservative assumptions. Okay. So what this really means, just to jump into statistics a little bit, this this when we get the 185 million, what this is really saying is that we're going to do deals like this. We're going to consider anyway deals like this many times, like 100 times. And for 90 of those 100 times, we're going to get an equity value of about 206 million. And for 10 of those times, we're going to get zero. So on average, after we've done this many times, like 100 times, we'll get on average 185 million as equity value per project. So that's really the statistical way to think about this. Yeah, so that was actually, sorry, that was actually 185.4, okay. All right, so now let's compare our estimate, our weighted average estimate of intrinsic value with what Mr. Market has to say. And the market price is always just number of shares outstanding times price per share, number of shares times price per share. Okay, so this is 10 million times $10, $10 per share. Okay, and that's equal to, in most circles, 100 million. Okay, so that's, that's what Mr. Market thinks the firm is worth. Oh, let me just put, no, nope, not that. Let's try again. Let me put that in there. Okay. And now we know everything we need to know. We have our best estimate of what the firm is worth based on using the balance sheet valuation method. We know what Mr. Market thinks the firm is worth. So we've got here 100 million Mr. Market versus, what did we say, 185 million for our estimate of the true value of the equity. So this is a lot less than what we think it's worth. And with this firm, we really could go in, buy the firm, sell the assets. A lot of people would, would have liked those assets in 2013 in New York State, pay off the liabilities and enjoy 
206 million if nothing went wrong and if Como came down like Bambi meets Godzilla, we would have gotten zero, but we wouldn't care too much because we're doing a whole bunch of deals like this. So on average for deals like this, we get 185. So we want to say, go for it, invest. Okay, so that's that's the idea. So you can see, even with real world firms, for a lot of firms that are relatively simple, this balance sheet valuation method uh, is really not too difficult to apply and, and works extremely well. And that's it for the balance sheet valuation method. So like I said, in the next chapter, we're going to continue using our great knowledge of uh, financial accounting, and we're going to start applying that to measuring the performance of entities' ongoing finances with ratio analysis and stuff like that. So until then, um, I'll look forward to seeing you in the discussions and in office hours, and we'll call it quits for today. Take care.